Well, tonight we're very pleased to have Janet Ackleman take us on an exploration of her vision for transformative public art. Through her art, Janet reshapes urban airspace uh, with monumental public sculpture that responds to the environmental forces of wind, water, and sunlight. Portugal is home to Janet's recent She Changes, a 160-foot tall waterfront netted wind sculpture which received the IFAI International Achievement Award and the Public Art Network's Year in Review Award. Her team won the Hoboken September 11th Memorial Competition, which will result in construction of a new memorial on the Hudson River. This year, she inaugurates two major commissions in North America, a new civic icon for Phoenix, Arizona, titled Her Secret is Patience, and Water Sky Garden for the Richmond Olympic Oval, an official venue for the 2010 Vancouver Olympic Winter Games. Exhibitions of Janet's work have been held around the world in Venice, Madrid, Bombay, Jakarta, Hong Kong, Kyoto, and New York City. She has been the recipient of a Harvard GSD Loeb Fellowship, the Aspen Institute Henry Crown Fellowship, and a Fulbright Lectureship, as well as grants from the New York Foundation for the Arts, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, Japan Foundation, Rotary International Foundation, and this year from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, which selected her for artist fellowships in two categories sculpture installation and craft. And the MCC said that this was the first time an artist was selected in sculpture installation and craft in the same year. She currently serves on the boards of the National Fulbright Association and the Aspen Institute Energy and Environment Awards. After graduating from Harvard College in 1987 with highest honors in visual science studies, she received graduate degrees in painting and in psychology and returned as a Harvard Loeb Fellow at the Graduate School of Design in 2007. From 1988 to 1993, Janet lived as an artist on the island of Bali, Indonesia, uh, before moving to New York City. She now lives in Brookline with her husband and two children. Please join me in welcoming Janet Eckelman. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim. Um, why don't we get started? So you wonder how in the world did you start to make these things? Like, where did that come from? Well, um, I'll tell you. In uh, the late 80s, I finished college with a very general um, liberal arts background, having never studied uh, sculpture. Uh, a, a semester of drawing and painting and mostly filmmaking. And let me find the little arrow. There we go. Oops, wait. So this was um, really one of my first pieces. It's a batiked canvas. I moved to Bali on my own because uh, I had visited there in college and felt more at home than I had felt anywhere else as an artist. Um, I guess I wasn't really an artist then, but I wanted to be one. And I decided that rather than spend my life waiting to go there on vacations, I should just live there and wait to go on vacation back home. And uh, this, this piece was seen by an artist named Robert Rauschenberg, who asked if he would curate, if he could curate a show of my work. And I said, okay. I didn't really fully appreciate um, who he was. That's the, the lack of background I had at the time. He said something at the opening which I have now come to appreciate more. This painting, uh, this triptych was shipped to the US and stretched onto stretcher bars and framed um, there in the gallery and, and um, Bob Rauschenberg actually collected it for his own private collection. But he said to me that he didn't like them uh, stretched because they lost the looseness and the ability to respond and that even in a gallery he said if I left them loose the wind currents in the gallery would make them change and move and I really didn't think about that much for maybe another decade um, so I had moved to a little a little house that I rented in these rice fields this is the village where I lived Ubud this is 
the annual annual festival down the main road, um, one of the local temples, um, and I don't I, I didn't consciously know why it was so important for me to be there and to live there, but it was, and I think it is in retrospect it's that the it's a visual language that everything was visually expressed and understood so much so that when there was a dance in the local temple, if the local dancer's knee wasn't uh, perpendicular, people would laugh because they really, everyone had a shared knowledge. Oops, wrong way. Uh, this is um, some images from Bill Mitchell's book from long ago called The Poetics of Gardens. And it talked about how people think about space in Bali it, within the, the region. Instead of having an objective north and south, Kaja and Klod, Kaja north really just means towards the holy mountain or the mother mountain. And so in our sense, if you're north of the mountain, then north becomes south and so forth. But what was so interesting was that even in the house compound where I lived and even in my bedroom, my bed and the pillow had to face the holy mountain. And within your, I think I can show you, within your house compound, the family temple is in the direction towards the, the mother mountain, and then your garbage and your pigs would be in the other direction. And within the village, that also the, the temples would be in the direction of the holy mountain, and then the other side would be where your cremation grounds were. And so I didn't really, I, I learned this after I came back um, I was invited to teach uh, for a semester at the GSD, and that's where I met Bill Mitchell and learned this. But intuitively, I knew in Bali that, that there was meaning in the way you felt in space and in, in the place. And that was very, very influential on me. Um, I lived there for five years on my own. And uh, after that, I, as I mentioned, I came to teach at Harvard for a semester. And I rented out my house to an American uh, business person, and they accidentally burnt it down um, with candles left unattended. And so this was my painting of my memory of my house looking out on the view out of my window. And it was sort of like all of those years of living and the memory of all the, the, those experiences uh, are invisible, but for me, here they are visible. They're these gestural strokes of, you know, whatever it is, energetic memory. Um, and there's the horizon line. And um, I once heard an artist say that your whole career is evident in your earliest work. And if I look back at this uh, painting, I sort of see the movement to these sculptures, which become just about gesture in space. So um, I decided to stay in Cambridge, um, feeling um, actually quite um, on, how can you say, when every earthly belonging you have is burned up and you realize that you're absolutely unharmed. Um, it was like both, uh, obviously it was a very difficult experience, but it was also very liberating. And so, um, I stayed in Cambridge for about five years, and uh, after that I got an itch to start traveling and living in another culture again. So I went to India on a Fulbright uh, to teach painting. I was still a painter, and I shipped all my paints. The, they invite Fulbright lecturers to send academic materials. So I thought, well, my academic materials are paints, so I packed up all of my you know, gallons of the finest paint that I wanted to use, and I promised the embassy that I would give a large exhibition for them. And lo and behold, they never arrived. And uh, they kept asking me for the image, for the invitation card, and I had no work. I had no materials. I just didn't know what to do. And I was in this um, place. This is um, in South India. You can see this. This is the Mahabali Shore Temple, a thousand-year-old carved stone temple near Madras. And they are, uh, have you know, a thousand-year history of sculpture. And so I thought I should embrace what was there rather than crying about what hadn't arrived. And I started learning to uh, cast bronze 
uh, in the lost wax method. And you can see the little bronzes. I, I didn't have enough money to buy enough bronze to make the gestures at the scale I wanted, and I, I knew it. And this was one of those bronzes, and this was one of those little bronzes. They, they were really small. And I finally realized that to, to realize the vision I wanted, I would have to find another material. And so every evening after I finished work in the foundry, I would walk to the beach, the one block to this beach, and I'd take a walk and a swim to kind of uh, exercise after a day in the foundry. And that was the same time when the fishermen were bringing in their nets. And there were these beautiful hovering forms sitting on the beach uh, that, and it just dawned on me that this might be a different approach to volume without mass and weight. And that it also had this practical aspect that you know, you could unwrap them and they could become big and monumental and then you could wrap them up and put them into a box. And I actually needed that since I had to uh, bring them with me on the train across India. There was no proper shipping budget for this exhibit. So uh, this, um, I took all of the bronzes, I drilled holes around the perimeter of each one and I um, went to talk with a fishing, a fisherman's family on this beach and they, uh, I made little sketches, little simple diagrams, and they knotted these shapes that I drew by hand. And I was sleeping under mosquito netting. And so I went to the tailors on the main road, and they sewed these out of the uh, mosquito netting. And incidentally, all the tailors are Muslim in this village, and all the fishermen are Hindu. And so this entire village, Hindus and Muslims, were working with me to create this series of work. Uh, this one on the on your left, I consider a self-portrait. It's called Wide Hips. Uh, this is a piece in Lithuania uh, at a place called the Museum of the Center of Europe. They invited me to do a piece. I didn't know what I would do, and they started introducing me to different uh, material culture. I mean, I really think I approach a place and a project as if I were a cultural anthropologist, um, looking for, trying to learn how, how do people make things here? How do they think about the materials that are naturally occurring? What is, what is the visual language here? Uh, what, is, what, what does color mean? Are, do patterns have certain meanings? And I really was a bit, um, I, I couldn't find what I wanted. And then near the end of this research, we visited a, a little lady who made doilies in her kitchen. She had lived through the World War uh, supporting herself on this um, craft. And so she taught me this method called baiting, which actually uses the same knots that the Indian fishermen used in their nets, but you, um, you put more than one loop in the knot, and that's how you can change your patterns. And so this piece is called Trying to Hide with Your Tail in the Air. I was invited back to India by a foundation, and I had the chance to work with the Hindu temple masons who, uh, they chisel brick to make the shapes of all the Hindu gods. And so we found a way to communicate without language where I would make physical models using clay and then they would build up the brick and then I would use uh, chalk and I brought a, a little circular saw and uh, they didn't like using saws and um, I was showing them how great these saws were and then of course my blade broke and, uh, and then they smiled very kindly and then they continued with their method. Um, and uh, we mirrored the shapes. So it was for me about sort of like the, the heaviness that pulls us to earth and uh, the mirroring of that in this adapting light form above. And it, it glows at night. And um, they've told me that they often find little offerings there that people from the village come. And they'll, inside there's, it's kind of sculpted out so you can, you can recline inside of it. This is a piece here in Cam well here in the Boston area at the Fog Art Museum, um, a temporary courtyard within a courtyard, made out of knitted stainless steel, 
and it uh, began to move. It went into an outdoor courtyard, eye of the storm. You can see the um, you can see the knitted stainless steel inside there. And I made this together with a, a, a bunch of undergraduate students in a squash court. We, we rigged up a sewing machine at one end and we cut all the patterns and just walked them down. And then it strung up. Then I was invited to Houston, Texas, and my site was the Interstate Highway, I-10. And uh, I had sort of had these experiences, um, you know, one might call them sort of you know, the exoticism of cultures other than one's own. And here I was face to face with the highway and I didn't know what, what visual language I would draw upon. And I, I just said, well, what, what is there? And the orange safety cone, uh, the black and white dotted line. And I inverted them uh, and the, in, the organization that had invited me was called Mother Dog Studios. And so this is for them. I think it turns the interstate into a pregnant dog. <laughs> and that became a series, the Roadside Shrine series. This is in New York City, uh, an art fair called the Armory Show. Uh, commissioned this as their first art project. And it glowed. And people could bump into it as they're waiting for their taxis. And it would just softly respond. And. Uh, and uh, continuing in the highway infrastructure, I kind of like these places that people tend to forget or don't pay any attention to such that this is a, a city in, in Florida, Tampa, Florida, and its waterfront is blocked by this giant concrete garage that nobody even knows where it is because they've just sort of blacked it out. And they asked me if I could make it um, habitable for people. That's, um, People felt very uncomfortable there, and so this is what I did. The lights are projecting shadows onto the wall with a kind of light uh, reference to Plato's cave, the color of fire. Um, and I was invited to Madrid, Spain, and this is their National Trade Fair complex where they host uh, ARCO, uh, the largest art fair in Europe, and I went uh, for one night visit to the space and it's this big round courtyard and I didn't know what to do and I woke up in the morning and I started thinking about Jasper John's target paintings and targets and the fact that because this was round it made me think of the bull ring which I'm sure was a very conscious reference for the architect and the fact that the center of a target is called bullseye and so this was target swooping down bullseye and it really is like a tailored piece of clothing for a building. It laces uh, on the upper right. This is a photo from an airplane. Uh, it laces to the railing on the roof deck. And so it's literally this like custom piece. I, I actually flew back to India to make it with the same group of fishermen. Uh, it took six families and myself six weeks, a million and a half hand knots. And uh, it has, so it's made in India with lace detailing that I learned in Lithuania. And it's being exhibited with references to Spain. And um, it's hard to, to figure out what to call this kind of work. It's, I think it's the opposite of globalization where everything becomes the same kind of mixed together to a homogenous you know, middle. This is like about the specificity of different places um, speaking to one another in my mind. And so that piece um, folded up into a big duffel bag and um, it started to travel a little nomadic life. Here it is in Spain at a an historic building there where Christopher Columbus was welcomed home by Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand from his voyage. And it's called the House of the of twine, so it seemed like the appropriate piece. And then it traveled to Rotterdam. Um, you can see Renzo Piano's building in the background. And they asked me to connect the cruise terminal to the, to the waterfront. And it, it, it's gone to many places, actually. But, um, then I got an email, which I thought might have been a prank, um, saying, uh, asking if I would be willing to design a permanent 
sculpture, similar to the ones I had been doing around the world uh, for the waterfront. And I thought, it, you know, maybe one of my friends was kind of doing some kind of a practical joke on me. Um, but in fact, I did respond, and they then sent photos. And um, Manuel Solo Morales was the urbanist for Porto, Portugal. And he had seen that piece in Madrid and asked if I might come in and design a piece here because fishing had been such a long uh, standing part of the culture. And this area had, has uh, smokestacks. It's an industrial part of the city that's being transformed. And uh, the red and white stripes here are taking that. You can see, let's see, can you see? See the three steel columns. Here you go. The three steel columns that hold it up are painted like smokestacks, and then those red and white stripes go into the netting itself. And here is uh, the shadow drawing. And there it is. Well, there's a lot more to this story, and I'll just keep it short. And if you have questions, you can ask them later. But uh, a a great deal of engineering goes into this, and I had the good fortune of finding an engineer who designs sails for America's Cup racing yachts and who had written some computational software to model fabrics that stretch. There was no one uh, that could be found anywhere who had modeled or had software to do with netting because the tensile architecture field is about having the fabric not move. and my work is about letting it respond and move and that, that dynamic fluid motion. And so um, we learned a lot about how things hang on the diamond and how you space it and how you create these forms with um, geometry. So this is the rendering phase. And I show it mostly because um, the renderings kind of look lousy. And it's very hard to envision what that looks like in a physical uh, reality. There are some of the engineering drawings for the structure. And there's a detail, so you can see some of those lace patterns. In this case, I studied Portuguese lace and looked at those patterns. Portuguese fishing traps uh, for shape. Um, it's now the city where this is uh, has taken this as their uh, symbol. There's the installation, three cranes at night pulling them up on pins. And uh, they show it as a silhouette with the name of their city now. And it's, it, there's a sense of ownership. I don't know if they know my name, that doesn't matter. It's that uh, different people feel that this somehow exemplifies their identity. And the fishermen in particular are a group that um, are struggling a little bit economically, and they have really embraced this as sort of the, the monument to them. And actually, like, um, sort of women's group think it's, it's sort of embracing and acknowledging uh, women's contribution to, you know, physical culture, <coughs> which is also, like, all of these layers of meaning are all true, uh, the maritime references and so forth. There it is at night glowing. I'll show you a few smaller projects. This is in New York at the Museum of Arts and Design. Uh, I was asked to do this, to do a project, uh, and like the next week, uh, the, the show was called Radical Lace Subversive Knitting. And um, North Korea detonated a nuclear test bomb. And I just didn't know what to, to how to respond to that, and so I, I, I lined up all the countries that had tested nuclear weapons, and I looked at the colors of their flags, and I put them in order. And I decided to make this mushroom cloud form out of those, um, those flags, and it's called the Expanding Club. And this is a project I'm in the middle of right now for the San Francisco airport. It's a new challenge um, for me to create this you know, I think if I ask myself, what are these works about? What am I trying to achieve? Uh, I really care about relationships that a, 
a person, a, a resident, would develop a relationship with the work through time, that it changes with the wind, with the sunlight, in different seasons. Uh, and, and so here I was asked to do a piece in an airport, and I didn't know how to achieve what, I, what, I, what I'm able to do out in nature, where I let nature be better than me, uh, which it always is. And so I just let nature and the, the changing currents of air, the choreography that's always changing, um, animate my work and create that beauty and flux uh, that is relational. And so the question was, how do I do that indoors? And they asked me, um, this is the new terminal. It'll be Virgin America's terminal if you ever fly there. Um, you go through security and you come out and they asked me that to create a, a zone of recomposure for your experience as you head towards your, you're holding your shoes in your hand. Um, <laughs> you know, as if artists could fix everything. <laughs> um, so I'm starting to work on this, and I'm really in, we're in design development. Um, but we are working with hidden wind machines that we're testing. We're working with lights that can change through time. Um, and I've been able to puncture the uh, roof and the ceiling uh, in three locations with skylights so that the work actually um, bridges this sort of internal world and goes out into nature and that sunlight comes down. And here's some of the, the sort of sketching in three dimensions with my engineers, Bureau Happold in New York. And here's some of the shadow studies and um, they have now agreed to let me um, put the shadows into the flooring. It's a terrazzo floor. So I'm now going to embed those shadows so you can see real shadows in contrast to the shadow that will be uh, of the solstice. And this is just sampling of color. I picked this project. I'm going to, um, because I think there are uh, a lot of architects and a lot of design professionals here, I thought I would take one project and show the design process and the collaboration with landscape architects, urban planners, architects, uh, lighting designers, and so forth. Uh, this is the Olympic Oval for the speed skating events for the Winter Olympics coming up in Vancouver. And this was the image when they invited me. They were looking for two artists, one to enhance this little wooden uh, cross bridge, and they wanted an artist to design some fountains. And um, I suggested that maybe there was an experience of getting from here to here that might be different and that if they would let me uh, rethink the whole space I'd be interested in working there and so they gave me these two commissions and let me combine them to create something and I started looking at the gardens in the area this is the Japanese garden at um, UBC called Nitobe and this is the Chinese garden and the neighborhood where this Olympic venue is located is um, is majority Asian population, the largest immigrant population in all of Canada. Incidentally, it has uh, an eight year longer average lifespan as well. Uh, and so as I walked through this garden, I compared the fact that it's about the same scale as as this. And it has to deal with water. This is dealing with runoff water from a five acre roof uh, that needs to be remediated. And the way I felt walking through this garden, I made this little sketch, little doodle. And then I made a little watercolor um, sketch about instead of crossing a cross on that wooden pedestrian bridge and that big highway, um, maybe you could meander through the way that you felt in a Japanese garden where everywhere you were was a destination. Um, and so I worked with an architect who built this three-dimensional model and we projected my sketches and drawings on it. And I looked at research. These are the dragon dances that happen in this area, the Lantern Festival. Uh, it also was the home of a lot of industrial fishing and canning factories that had a lot of different ethnic groups uh, and also there uh, the native tribes there, the Musqueam Band, uh, still teach their kids to fish right at that location. So there seem to be a lot of references 
um, that I wanted to weave in. And we had a charrette, and I shared these ideas with this tremendous team. Uh, this is the architect from Canon Design. This is Chris Phillips from PFS Landscape Architects. And um, Hudson Backer were the urbanists uh, who worked with me there. And everybody, um, it, it was one of those rare, you know, rare experiences where everybody just kind of went in and started working with materials in our hands and we we tested out different ways of moving through the space and it was what you want a collaboration to be, you know, um, that rarely happens. It wasn't serial work like you do my your thing and then I do my thing, but we actually were really envisioning this, taking those ideas and, and creating something else. Uh, then we looked for references and uh, this was the redesigned floor plan or plan with lanterns that would glow at night up in the air and a meandering red boardwalk that would allow you to move through the space and fountains that are made out of air bubbles that clean the water and mirror the shapes above you. And these are the finite element analysis um, images on the computer of the engineer I'm working with. I just did a screenshot to sh share that part of the experience renderings. Uh, and then here you can see like one form moving through the analysis. So blue means that it's fine and when it becomes green and red, those are the places that have stress points that need to be adjusted. Uh, here's the model building and there's um, a model. And then the steel armatures are built. The net is made out of a Teflon material, PTFE. And that's the before and the after. And this photo is by a, a talented photographer who's here in the audience, Peter Vanderwalker, who's also a Loeb Fellow. Actually, all of these, these are Peter's photos. I feel very privileged to have him photograph this work. So you can see the the red walkway here, and the different colors uh, referring to the Dragon Dance and the Lantern Festival. There, the Olympic insignia and the reflection. And they become like lanterns at night. And I'm gonna end with one project that uh, just opened this year in Phoenix, Arizona. I was brought in, this is a two city block project where they bought up all the parking lots and actually a famous strip club and um, decided they were going to make a new park, a central park for the city that would also serve as a campus for the university they wanted to grow, the ASU campus. And there were two historic buildings that they wanted to preserve here and here. And uh, after I was brought in, we started to make, you know, nice, simple old models, pipe cleaners and styrofoam. And um, I worked with my engineers to understand what kinds of shapes and what scales would be allowed within the parameters. Uh, 30 foot deep caissons to hold up the structure. And these were um, analyzing the viewing corridors that I learned from the city were the, this is their, their walking street that they're developing and so how to, how to um, build on that and to reference uh, parts of desert, the skeletons of desert flora. And so here's that same view, then the beginning of construction with the armature and the cable systems that hold it up and then the actual work. This is um, showing you a little bit of the computational software that, um, there you go. I've been working with engineers to develop to create these forms. And there's the finite ele element analysis, which was written specifically for this work. Surface discretization. 
And remember I was telling you about the Lithuanian lace, so here are the construction drawings explaining those details, sort of how to bring craft uh, into this process. Um, studying color and sampling and testing different color. Um, I want to eventually have it change through time. And um, because I was a painter, I still think of color as mixing color, like with a palette knife. And so I now mix different percentages of color into my twine. So all the twines are custom made. And here is a detail of the netting, we have to have backup systems so that if one knot fails, there's a whole system that protects it. And this is to avoid abrasion and coverings to avoid abrasion. This is a section. And there are the details of that work. Construction drawings. These are the instruction lists for the industrial machine operators. Um, and it says, go eight rows, the mesh is 3.2 inches. Now go 10 rows at 3.8 inches. So this is like how to break it down into a recipe that can be followed. And here is in the factory with, um, with craftsmen uh, who were previously working machines are now, are now really using them as, um, as an art tool. This is the modeling of the center uh, to make it fall as if it's moving through space but yet is falling with gravity so that that wouldn't fall straight down and bump into the net to create the pattern and shape to make it move. These are the models of the wind. This is with no wind, just the self-weight and gravity. Here is 30 miles an hour and 90 miles an hour. finite element analysis. The red is the area that we have to adjust. And there's the built reality. There it is at night. There are 20 different lights, each with a different colored dichroic glass lens. And through the seasons, through the year, it changes through time. So in the winter, it should be warmer to kind of counteract and be a generous relief. And then in the summer, the colors become cooler. And uh, it moves with all the wind and the breezes. The desert storms um, create an entirely different mood. And what I'm hearing is that it's changing the behavior of how people are downtown, that for the first time ever, people go out and lie on the grass and just stay there and look up. And this has never happened, I'm told, in downtown Phoenix. I have been approached about a piece for the Greenway, and I think there is some fundraising that is, is they're working on. Um, so I, I hope so. Oh, we actually even have done some sketching for it, so it actually is more in existence than. But I don't want to show it until it's you know there. Yes. <laughs> Who built that steel and made Who fabricated it? Who fabricated it? We work almost in every situation. We try to work with the trades who are already on site. So we use the same steel fabricator that was working on the oval. Uh, we used um, the same rigging. Um, and and I, I hired the same urbanists and architects to run the project on site because they could be there every day and I couldn't. So, But uh, the one in Phoenix, we um, hired a roller coaster maker because um, those tubes were big and that was the only place where they could roll those curves. Yeah. 
Who would have thunk? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like a data. We're working on it. This is in early design development. We're trying to get a kind of responsiveness that way so that you, you know what's happening outside while you're inside. Because an airport is such a controlled environment. Um, it's, it's a very challenge, it's a new set of challenges, uh, how, how to create that expressiveness within um, a, a fairly rigid set of constraints. But um, those are questions that are right along the lines of what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Yeah, the early work, yeah. As an artist. Uh huh. Um, I didn't become an artist because my professors said I had talent, or you know, because they didn't. You know, I made a B minus in drawing. You know, everything said, you know, who are you to think you can go out and do this? And it took me a long time to find my voice. Um, sculpture. I mean, I think the beauty of sculpture for me is that I had never, ever studied it. And I had no idea how to do it. You know, like, you know, this is backwards sculpture, right? You know. Um, so I feel really good saying I'm a sculptor, partly because, you know, I feel like I have no credentials to be a sculptor. So I don't, I don't know. It, uh, I mean, I have no training to be working in these other fields either. So it's this collaboration of uh, maybe the biggest skill is in finding really talented people to work with and enjoying that process. I mean, the collaboration is such a privilege. You know, these brilliant engineers and brilliant architects and landscape designers and, you know, these simple uh, concepts suddenly, you know, turning into these whole environments. Um, and so that is the fun and the privilege. You know, I pinch myself. You know, it's like I, I'm awake. <laughs> you know, so yes. I'm curious about the transformation oh. you did your temporary commitment to many of your hand models. Yeah. Um, and the transformation to the industrial model. Right. Um, Um, I want to answer each part of your question. First, what, what are they making? They are making commercial fishing net, and as the market moves overseas to China and Costa Rica, in order to compete, they're making more specialized nets, including netting for buildings, like um, these big box stores. They're, they're making safety netting that is used and then pulled up and holds the insulation in. So they're, they're you know, they're trying to change and adapt, and so that's why they'd be willing to work with some crazy artist like me, um, and they've been great. So the whole transition to industrial fabrication started because, well, the scale, but not so much because I had made really large work by hand, um, but it needed to have a warranty. Uh, and it needed to be reliable, it needed to be reproducible, and it needed to be pulled tight in such a way that they can do with the machines. They have these tighteners that they can do, and we couldn't pull them that tight by hand. And then it was a whole process of, you know, asking myself what was it I loved about the handmade. And I'm very, very attached to the idiosyncrasies and the slight you know, asymmetry that our body has, that a handmade chair has, you know, and how, and we, and I worked with engineers who so understood my love of the handmade, and we figured out, you know, like, where do you need that uh, handmade quality, the idiosyncrasy, and there's a lot of handwork in, in these uh, industrially made pieces, um, but it's not all handmade, and we found this 
I, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's actually significant because there, there are these, there, there are panels that come off the machine, and then they're all hand joined, and in in different, there are things you can do by hand that right now we we don't have machines can that can do that. So, um, y yes. If I ask myself, like, what is the content of the work? What's it about? Well, I think I'm aiming at a place that is pre-verbal, which is a very hard place to work as an artist. It's hard to be written about by critics, because it's, you know, if you think about that experience before you really had language, when, you know, I think when I was a kid uh, and I went to the state fair and I got lost, you know, it was like a whole world. And then I went back when I was a teenager and it was like, hmm. You know, like how, how, how do we still experience that sense of, you know, awe and, and, you know, and a sense of covering. When I lived in Bali, the thing, I, it was like the first time I was comfortable in buildings because they're these porous buildings, like, you know, you're both inside and outside at the same time. And these are, you know, it's like that sense of protection. When I would sit on my porch in Bali and it would rain, the big rains would come. So there's this sense of being protected, but yet not, um, not overly enclosed. So like I'm part of nature, but yet I'm sheltered. And so I think that feeling, the, the, you know, it's experiential art, it's not, overtly political in its, you know, like it's meant to give you a certain experience, you know, whatever that is, and then you, you, you find your own meaning and, and, you know, whatever that, how that resonates with you at the time that you're there. So uh, it's not about, you know, a jellyfish. But I, I agree with you that I also see a lot of similarities with marine forms. And um, there is a, a, a part, when I was a college student, I studied with um, an evolutionary biologist named Stephen Jay Gould, who some people might know, and uh, like the history of Earth and life. And uh, there was a group of life forms that I did my, you know, my project on that um, developed and died uh, in the Precambrian era, hundreds of millions of years ago. And, um, they were all surface area, like my work. They were only one cell thick. And so all the different variation that they had was this geometric uh, form that could be created with, with um, a flat surface. And so, you know, th that quality of life form, it it's as if I have the same constraints as that life form had. And, I'm designing, you know, wh however life is designed. Um, that is why they resemble sea animals. And the other aspect that's really interesting to me is, like the gentleman in Portugal talks, you know, like, is that what it looks like underwater? And as I've come to understand that, we, that air is a fluid, it's just that we don't see the fluid nature of it. We see the fluid nature of water. And so in a way, these nets are showing they're allowing us to see the fluid nature of the air. Well, when I said that I did not imply the meat, yeah, yeah. because the meat mm -hmm. is different depending, and as you were saying, it's very fluid, yet there is this other sort of comment, like the comment 
Mm-hmm. That's part of the goal. Well, there are a lot of questions. Um, how about here and then there? Okay. Uh, does carbon dates matter as severe weather effected, but also what kind of maintenance are they <sighs> They are engineered for 90 mile an hour winds. They have to meet code and get permits. Um, they've been through lots of storms. Um, the maintenance depends on which material is selected. Um, the Teflon fiber is a very long-lasting fiber, um, Tanara. Um, it's used in architectural treatments. It's 100% UV resistant, doesn't change or corrode or lose, power, uh, lose strength. Um, in some instances, it's actually more cost-effective to use a recyclable low-cost material. Uh, we, the Phoenix piece is a high-tenacity polyester. Uh, because they have dust storms, and it turns out that the labor to bring it down and wash it is actually more than fabricating more and recycling them. So we, instead of using a high-cost material like, like Teflon, we went to a low-cost recyclable material. So, and the steel is, you, you know, yeah, has to be painted every 15 years, and yeah, it's tanemic paint. Yeah, yes? I'm sorry, I thought you, you called the first piece you showed us a picture. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, I guess you opened the question. Have I, have I uh, designed pieces that are more than one shape interacting with one another? Yes, yeah, uh, correctly. Uh, for outdoors, not yet, although one of the sketches that I, preliminary sketches that I made for the Greenway does involve more than one form, if it, if it comes to be. So that would be exciting. Um, and actually, this project I showed the beginnings of in, in the San Francisco airport is multiple forms, and you move through. So we'll, we'll see. But that is an interest of mine to have that. Uh, even in Phoenix, I was open to having more than one sort of visual event. Uh, but I asked what, what they wanted. And they wanted one. They were set on this idea of an icon. That's what they wanted. They wanted one big thing. So that's what I designed. Yes. Well, the, the luminescent uh, quality of that of the sculpture in Phoenix is yeah. just almost magical. And I'm just wondering, is, mm. are you blending that with, with white light and the light is the color displaced from the netting, or are there just different colors of lights reflecting on different parts of the netting? Or the each, well, it's just metal halide lights. You know, this it was due to cost, we couldn't have computer controlled colored lights. Uh, but we've, we've turned that into a into a benefit in that um, the different colors of lights illuminate different parts of the net at different times. So um, the lighting designer, very talented, uh, worked at calibrating those color frequencies, Paul Deeb. And, uh, The interaction of the colored light and the colored, all of the net is colored. Uh, all of the twine has a real physical color, and then there is a color of light that interacts differently at different times of the, the lunar calendar and the annual calendar. So, I was so excited. I've had that idea for a long time, and to be able to have that realized was so exciting. Usually, you know, you get to the lighting and there's no more budget. <laughs> yes. The comment you just made about Phoenix reminds me of something I know I'm aware of. I was wondering about do you have an artistic idea that then takes a special technology yeah. to bring it to the screen? Yeah. But a lot of large scale environmental art is also often designed by committee. And you said like Phoenix was. What you were thinking about was like day one. And how often do you run into that kind of having to modify your ideas based on what the Hmm. And it, well, there, there's more than one part to that. It, the, what I said, um, 
I go in fairly open. Like I want to understand, you know, what it, what it, what's the hunger in this place, you know? Because um, you know, I mean, I, I, it, I want it to be a generous uh, intervention. Um, so that wasn't because I wanted to have multiple events and they wanted one. I was asking them, you know, and, and where do you want this to be visible from? And help me to understand. I haven't lived here. So I don't know where I want to look up. Just to bring your eyes up into the sky is already, you know, an important act in in that environment. Um, there are always compromises. Um, I don't even want to say what they are because you know it, it's. Um, I know them. I see them. You know, I may die a little inside each time I see certain things, but. You don't know. It's like um, I was trained as a classical pianist my whole growing up. And you know, when you go out to play, you make a mistake, but you keep going because they may not know what the music was. <laughs> they might. But you know, uh, so it has its own life. You have your own reading. And um, I think the key thing I've been learning is how to pick my battles. And to be very clear and to ask myself which things I can compromise on and which things I cannot. And, and then I'm ferociously adamant about the things that I cannot compromise about. And those, and I'm clear, like it, certain things I would walk away if I had to. If it, you know, and, and people understand those, those things are central to the work and without them the work is not, it's not mine. Um, but then those other things, you know, one has to um, get one's work built. And so there's a balance, but I think the the learning is knowing which ones are critical. Yes. We've never. I mean, uh, I haven't run studies, but we have built pieces for many years, and we've never had that problem. Um, they put cover nets. Um, to stop the, the net from blowing up and injuring itself or getting tangled. Uh, we once had a, um, a soccer ball kicked in, uh, and then we put a cover net up so we don't have those problems anymore. Yes, in the back. Well, it's very much about creating that sense. I mean, um, the curator you heard in the video, Mary Lou Knode, um, talked about this becoming the heart. Like, uh, there, it has views to the, uh, to the mountains, but it also is creating certain kinds of, they wanted me to create a kind of magnetic flow in the city up that walking street. So it's, it's sort of breathing in conjunction with the other urban flow. Um, and I do think, you know, the goal of, of like creating that sense I had when I lived in Bali of feeling like the place is supposed, it's intentional, it's, it's meant to be this way. Um, people have told me like they can't imagine it as it, they can't imagine when it wasn't there. Um, that, that, that is the goal is to create that feeling. There were, I think there were, okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly, I, I thought that was wonderful what you said about you don't see the world. Uh, you see it only through your filter, as you say. Uh, it's a good direction to go. Uh, you don't see the world in the music a great deal. Yeah. Failures or good moments in the artistic mm -hmm. You mean harnessing energy? I mean, we're talking about that, you know, photovoltaic and um, the wind itself as a power generation tool. It's not impossible. Um, difficult for it to be meaningful energy. Yeah. Good. 
Oh, one more. Maybe that'll be the last question. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Phoenix, it's the city. I think there, there were dedicated funds that uh, were allocated to be spent on public art. And in fact, there became a very large, um, you know, there were dozens of articles in the newspaper um, because the piece was when there were financial issues in the city. Um, that's been a place kind of ground zero for property, um, sort of the economic um, downturn. And um, there were, there was grassroots protests to the idea of canceling this sculpture, which was funded with municipal funds, but they were funds that could not be spent for anything other than public art. Um, and actually, this was a turning point in the identity of the city because uh, 20 years prior, there had been upward criticizing public art and you know, all the sort of typical things you expect to hear, you know, why should taxpayers' money be spent on this? And in this case, I think there were almost 100 people showed up at City Hall with placards. I support the Eckelman sculpture. And, and people spoke. Uh, you heard the curator mention, you know, when I spoke at City Hall, like she came because she had seen the work in, in Portugal. And actually, architect Will Bruder uh, came to City Hall because he happened to have been in Portugal on his way to see uh, Cisa's work and encountered the sculpture. And, uh, you know, he said, uh, one day people from Portugal will be traveling to Phoenix to see our work. Um, and uh, it was an about turn from having been canceled because the public uh, expressed so vociferously their desire to have this. The other thing that I think made the difference was that it was a coalition. It wasn't the usual voices that one that the city might dismiss. It wasn't. It was the Arts Council and all of the arts activists and so forth. But it was also the Downtown Business Association came out with a public uh, statement in favor of the work because they felt it would assist revitalization of downtown businesses, which I understand it is doing. So I think it was the broad base of support and, um, and this change of identity. Like, who are we as a city? And what do we want to be known for? And, and you know, culture is part of the new identity. And I, it was very exciting. Um, I think for them to define themselves uh, with this as the vehicle. So maybe that is a good place to stop. Thank you, Janet, for your extraordinary insights and stories about your work. Uh, one last note, um, we'll gather again here at the library again on December 16th to hear Patty Marino, who'll share her passion for urban gardening and her message of sustainable living. Uh, urban sustainable living. Uh, thank you again and good evening.